Hello, hello everybody. I see that some people are still incoming, so maybe we are going to wait for two or three more minutes. And sorry for the delay. We had some small problems. Uh, uh, today we will have a seminar about the intersubject variability and how we can deal with that uh, with the IVIVC and how we can overcome this problem about the variability and the same thing if we can use or not for example the mean value and how we can scale between studies so i see that we have almost as a plateau for the number of attendees because now we are fixed for that so we are going to start uh, during this meeting, you can, uh, using the chat, ask all the questions that you want. It's not a problem. And the moderator is going to be down, who is going to uh, select the questions if she had to select anyone, and also to see when to propose me the questions. The first thing that I want to discuss with you about the viability is why viability is so important, not only for me, but in case of the IVIVC because you have variability everywhere. You have variability, for example, between the dissolution curves, for example, between two or three or four or six or 12 vessels, you can have not exactly the same results. That can be linked with either the identical methods or your formulation. You have the same thing in vivo, but in vivo, in addition, you add variability between the people or even within the people, which is called the intra-subject variability. Very often, this part of variability is underestimated and including in the IVIVC because, for example, for the predictability, uh, they ask you to see if you have plus or minus 10% of difference versus the original value or versus the reference value, but they don't discuss about the variability. The variability could be of different nature and you have to know if you can control it, yes or no. And you have always to take it into account with pragmatism. That means, for example, when you have two studies and you want to pull the data of the two studies, you have to be careful how you can set up the viability that you can have between the subject and between the two studies. The overview of this presentation is going as follows. We are going to discuss about what is IVIVC very shortly, very briefly. Then we will discuss about the viability. That means what is the difference between subject, within subject and between studies viability. And then we are going to see how we can perform IVIVC in case of crossover or parallel design and what is a mean value, a median value, a geometric means, and which are the drawbacks of each of them. We will see also that we can reintegrate viability all the time. And I will show you how we can use uh, uh, viability and scaling between study within Phoenix as well as other alternative approaches. So IVIVC, excuse me, it's a collaborative approach. That is a slide that you have seen up front in some of the presentations that I made. But we have always to take into account that IVIVC is here in the middle. This IVIVC need to have in vitro dissolution data which are going to reflect the in vitro release which is going to be linked with the formulation that means we need data of the formulation department but also from the analytical department in vivo i need to have the in vivo release the in vivo release is going to be linked of course with the performance of the formulation that you have in vivo and the plasma concentration curve this in vivo release which is going to reflect the in vivo dissolution of your drug is going to be linked with in vivo data provided by the clinical department when you are allowed to make the link between the in vivo release and the in vitro dissolution which is the in vitro release you can have then a model which is going to link the in vitro and in vivo. Using this model, you can predict data. But also, in addition to the formulation department, analytical department, and clinical department, you have uh, also to take into account the regulatory department because you will have to submit the data and you can use it for variations and scale up post approval changes, for example. The quality assurance because you need to have the key quality attributes of your formulation or process and the project management. It can be strange to see that you need or you could have a project management here. It's very easy. As, as you need data from various departments, you have to make in such a way that all the departments are going to collaborate together and to share the data and results together. Now IVIVC what it is. It is something which is going to link data and you have three levels of IVIVC. The most powerful one which is called level A and the less informative in theory which is the level C. 
in level A, you are going to make a link between in vitro dissolution and in vivo absorption. Each single triangle in this case is going to present a various time that you are going to observe in vitro and in vivo, and the same one between vitro and vivo. You can have a time scaling, of course. That means you are going to have in this respect one link for one formulation. If you use more than one formulation, you will try to have the same link between vitro and vivo for all the formulation, that means a common IVIVC. In case of level C IVIVC, you are going to have a link between one in vitro parameter and one in vivo parameter, for example, the Cmax and the time at which you have 50% dissolve, or for example, what you are going to observe at 30 minutes. In this case, each dot that we have here is going to represent one formulation. So that means you are not going to use the full data that you have by formulation, but only a restricted set of data for each formulation. So the level C is seen to be less informative, but that depends, we can discuss about that, on the fact that if you have a link between all the pharmacokinetic parameters which are relevant for bioequivalence and in vitro, you are allowed to predict Cmax and AUC as well as other parameters. With level A, you are going to predict the full plasma concentration curve, but among this full plasma concentration curve, what is going to be important very often, it's only the AUC and the Cmax. Now, what is viability? Viability is something which is existing everywhere and has various sources. You have different types of viability, the between subject, which is called intersubject, and the intrasubject, that means the viability within yourself. That can be linked with various sources. You can be different from your neighbor because you don't have the same sex, the same age, because you don't have uh, the same communications and so on. You can be different within yourself between today and tomorrow because you are less stressed today and you are going to be more stressed tomorrow. Because tomorrow you have, you are going to eat something and you are going to increase, for example, your blood pressure because you increase the quantity of caffeine. That is going to be the intra-subject viability. The source can be, of course, linked with physiology. That is the case of caffeine, sex, and so on. That can be linked also with a formulation. That means you can have a huge viability between subjects because your formulation is not stable. That can be linked with the drug itself. For example, when you have a high metabolized drug, in this case, the first pass metabolism is going to be very important, and you may have differences between the uh, between two intake of a drug linked with the first pass effect. You can have also viability linked with genetical errors and of course with the calculations. How to solve it is not always possible. And you have to deal with the viability and the viability is a small graph which is here. You have, for example, in three occasions you take and you give a drug that can be, for example, a dose in IIT study. You can have viability between the answer that means between the subject, but also if it's the same subject in a crossover design, you can have a viability between the intakes. Let's see that a little bit more. For example, the between subject viability can be something that we can call intrinsic factor. Why? Because it's going to belong to the subject. That can be age, sex, genotyping, phenotyping, habits, everything like this. Between individuals, it's a fact that you are going to be different. But if you are in a crossover design, that is not so important. Have a look to the graphic here. Imagine the subject number two, which is here in purple. You can see that the subject in majority of the cases is the higher subject here, here, and here. Of course, between the intake and the formulations, you don't have the same answer and response, which is logic, because that can be linked with the formulation. But the subject two is always the highest one, almost all the time. So that means even if you have a difference between the intake, it remains constant in the way is reacting, always high. Vice versa, the subject here, 12, you can see that is low, but is low for all the formulations. So that means in this case, you may have between the subject two and 12, a huge between subject viability, but within the subject, you may have something which is more consistent. So that means, what is the impact of that? If you are in a crossover design, that means if the subject receive all the formulations, the impact of the between subject viability is not so high, because what is important for you is to have a viability within the subject, which is coherent. 
intrasubject subject can be linked with a lot of things and mainly with the first pass metabolisms. A high intrasubject subject variability can be the case, for example, for the highly viable drugs. And very often, the highly viable drugs are drugs which exhibit a high first pass metabolisms. And that means you have a quantity of drug which reach unchanged the systemic blood flow, which is going to depend about your hepatic function, but also about the blood flow. And in this case, with highly viable drugs, you are going to have uh, something which is going to be a uh, um, replicated design to decrease or to estimate rightly this intra-subject variability. That can be linked, I told you, with everything, food, age, sex, but also the hepatic function. Hepatic function is something that you can assess partly with something which is called the clearance. So that means what is quite important very often, and we will see that in one of the last slides of this presentation, is that sometimes you are going to be allowed to try to scale by the clearance. Now, what can we have? Imagine that we have two bioecron study, each of them in a crossover design. We have a study A with a test one versus reference and the study B with a test two versus reference. You are going to say it's not a problem because in the test one versus reference, that means in the study A, I am in a crossover. That means if one subject is high, it's going to be high for the test and reference, test one and reference. The same thing for study B. For study B, we can have a variability between subjects, but we are in a crossover. That means a subject which is low for the test two can be low for the reference. But now, if we want to pull the two studies together, or for example, if we have used the study A to establish my IVIVC and the study B to make the external predictability, that means to show that my IVIVC allows me to predict accurately the answer, that means the in vivo performance of a test two, I may have a problem because the subject that I will have in the study A are not going to be the same one as the subject that I am going to have in the study B. So that means I can have an answer in the study B which is going to be higher than in the study A, not because my formulation are not equivalent, but only due to the fact that I don't have the same subjects. That means between studies, I am not anymore in a crossover design, I am more in a parallel design between the two study. That means I have a between subject variability in addition for the, to the within subject variability that I have within each study. And between study, I am back to a between subject variability. So have a look here. Imagine that I have reference one, reference on the study one, test one. You can see here that the mean value of the test one is smaller than the mean value of the reference. No problem on that. That was a pilot study on 12 uh, healthy volunteers. You have here, of course, the mean and geometric mean value and so on. No problem. What we can say is that you are going to optimize the formulation test one and you are going to try to have something which is going to be closer to the reference. That means knowing the key factors and the key quality attribute of your formulation and or process, you are going to using, for example, a design experiment to try to optimize this formulation, to be close to the reference formulation. Of course, you can see that here, you can have a difference between the mean, the geometric mean, and also with the median. But we are going to go back to that later on. Now, I have here, with, if I have a larger variability, I can have something like this. You can see that I have more dispersion of the results. You can see also that in this case, the mean and the geometric mean are more different than previously. The same thing for the median. But also that is going to be studied later on. Now, what I am going to do? What I am going to have is to be also in some cases when I want to compare two studies like in parallel design. When I am in parallel design, that means I have not the same subject which is going to receive all my formulations, but very often we are going to receive only one and one sole formulation. So that means if I have a difference between the formulation, I have to try to distinguish is that is due to the fact that I have not the same behavior between the formulation or if I don't have the same subjects. How can I deal with that compared to a crossover design where the subject is his own reference? Very often I increase the number of subjects. But when I have going to 
when I want to pull two studies, study A and study B, I cannot increase too much the number of subjects because somehow I'm in crossover in each of them. So what is the problem? The problem is as follows. This is the test one from the previous study. You recognize it. I had to increase the quantity and the release of the drug to be closer to the reference. So that means I create the test two. And this test two, I am going to compare it to the reference. It must be higher than the test one, but somehow it must be close to the reference. Now, if I compare here the step two, that means the test two, excuse me, for the study two to the reference of the study one, I can see that I am much higher than the reference. My problem is, do I fail my optimization or that is that due to the fact that I don't have the same subjects? So I have to compare in this case, the step three here, the reference that I administered a new time in the study two with my test two and to see if I am close together, yes or no. If I want to pull all the data together, uh, it's the fact that do I have here or not to compare the reference of the study two and the reference uh, of, the study, of the study one to compare if I have exactly or not the same uh, behavior between of the reference between the two studies. That is, are the differences that I'm going to observe link with the study or link with the formulation? So uh, something which is quite important, and it's more easy to see it on the mean curve, it's like this. I have the reference one, which is the yellow curve here. I have the test one, which was here. I tried to optimize the test one to be closer to the reference. And the result that I have for the test two is the green curve here. You can see that the green curve is much higher than the reference one. But as the reference two, the reference, excuse me, of the study two is here, you can see also that between the two references, I have a higher value. That means the higher value of the test two, which is here, is not only due to the fact that I have optimized too much my formulation, but to the fact that having not exactly the same subject between the studies, they don't react in the same way. And in the study two, they, in two quote, overreact compared to the study one. So here you can see that I'm closer to the reference that I have in the study two versus the test two, which is here. So that means when I have to scale between study, I must have something which is a common formulation between the studies. I'm going to discuss that later on. But now the question is, I'm going to use the individual values or I'm going to use some central value like mean. Knowing that I don't have the same subject between the studies, is that does that make sense to use the individual values? We will see that it's a little bit more complicated even when I have only one in one case, something which is a unit impulse response, for example, only in one study. So that means in this case, what I can do, can I use a unique impulse response which is common for all the subject, which can belong to another study, or I cannot allow to make any more IVIVC. The use of the individual value would lead to prediction and to adjust when I want to predict back subject by subject. If I want to predict back subject by subject, I will have to use something which is the PK parameter for each subject. If I do something like this, that means I'm going to adjust to the clearance. That means I am going to adjust subject by subject to the quantity which is really absorbed. However, adjusting the absolute variability is something which is not allowed in the guidelines. So you can see that the position is not so easy and, to, and it's not so clear to know if I have if I am allowed or not to make it subject by subject or to use the mean values. What save the guideline very often is that you have to make the deconvolution subject by subject, then to use the mean of the deconvoluted data, then to make a common IVIVC, and then to predict subject by subject back. But that means you have to convolute subject by subject and you adjust for the clearance in this case. So not so clear. And if you don't have the PK profile for each subject, then you are not allowed to deconvolute subject by subject. 
So in case of crossover design, if I have a unit in push response, which can be VIV, which can be a very fast formulation compared to your slow release, you could perform individual deconvolution and you could use this UIR to predict subject by subject. But if you don't have it, that means if you have a UIR from another study, you are back to a parallel design and to the between subject variability. So if you want to scale in this case between the two studies, you will need to have a common formulation between the studies. If you use the central value that is going to allow and to simplify the processes, that can be, for example, the case when you start with a pilot study, when you optimize in the study to the formulation and you want to predict and to make the external predictability, and you don't want to have again the IV because it's too expensive and too heavy, then you are going against to make a new adjustment with the third study. The problem is that you need something which is common between all the study to be able to scale. The more easy thing in this case is to use the reference formulation when you are in case of generics, or to use one common formulation in all the studies, which can be, for example, the target formulation or something which is close to the target formulation. To use central value means that you are going to use mean, median, or geometric mean, or harmonic means, or something else. You have that in Phoenix in the descriptive statistics. You have basic statistics, then you have statistics which are based on the range and so on. The mean is very simple. You take the sum of all the values and you divide by the number of occurrence. That is very easy. The median is something which is going to cut in two parts the distribution. You will have 50% of the subject below the median and 50% of the subject over the median value. Median value is the second quartile, the 50th percentile, or it's called the median. What is the interest of the median value compared to the mean is that you have less influence of extreme value. In the mean, when you have one extreme value is going to impact a lot of the sum. When you are going to make the medium, one extreme value is going to be counted as one, like all the others, because you are going to cut the distribution in two equal parts, independently of the magnitude of the values that you are going to observe. But you have something which is also existing, which is called the geometric mean. Geometric mean is something that you use very often, for example, when you make bioequivalence, because you make a lot transform of your data making a logarithmic transformation of your data, that means you are going to use a geometric mean. A geometric mean is nothing more than transforming all the data in log, dividing by the number of occurrence, then you are going to make the mean here of your logs, and then what you are going to do here is to take the exponential function here to have the inverse if you use here a natural log. If you use a decimal log, you are going to take a power of 10, of course. But the problem of geometric mean is that the log of zero is not existing. So that means when you have a value below the limit of quantitation, the question is, how are you going to deal with that? You are going to say that it's a missing result. It's not missing because it's existing, but BLQ. You are going to take it as zero. In this case, if you take it as zero, you cannot calculate anymore the geometric mean. If you replace the BLQ by LOQ divided by two, that will lead to a plateau at the end of the curve and errors is an estimation, for example, of terminal half-life and something like this. If you use BLQ divided by two, if you have less than X percent of a subject, okay, are you going to use BLQ divided by two only for the first non-zero, the first zero value, that means the first BLQ value, and then missing for the others? But if you're missing for the others, that means that at the last part of the curve, you could have, for example, on 24 subjects, 24 subjects for 24 hours, for 36 hours, only 18. Then you have only 12 for 48 hours and only three for 72 hours. And you are going to calculate the mean on three values, which is also a nonsense. So what you are going to do here, you can uh, try to use what is called the BLQ module in Phoenix to try to set up rules which are going to be applied in all the subjects. Now, when I can calculate or not a central value, when is that going to impact or not a lot the data? That will depend, of course, uh, on the type of data that you have. 
In this case, I have a slow release formulation and a delayed release formulation. When I have a slow release formulation, you can see here that the mean value is reflecting almost the curve that I had for all individuals. When I have a delayed release formulation here with various peaks at various times, you can see that that mean curve is not reflecting at all the uh, individual values. You can see that I can have peaks which can be, uh, the T max can be here at, for example, two hours, as well as, for example, at eight hours here. But in this case, making this mean curve is not at all something which can be of interest. So you are not allowed to use mean curve all the time. In some cases like this one, you may be able to use it if you correct by the lag time. So that means you, can, you are allowed to make a mean curve when you don't have huge differences in the shape of the curve. I don't speak about the magnitude of a curve, but only the shape of a curve between subjects. By the way, for the delayed release, you have it on the Certera webinar that you can have a look to, which was made on how to perform IVIVC for delayed release formulation. This is, for example, the mean of the individuals. You can see this is all my individuals. You can see that the AUC is around 4,000, my Tmax around 2,400. When I use the mean curve, you can see that my AUC is almost correct, but you can see that my Cmax is not at all accurate. This is quite logic because I am making means with data which cannot be mean together. So what I can do in this case is to correct by the lag time subject by subject. Correcting by the lag time subject by subject allows me to have something which is going to be more correct. Go to this webinar about how to make IVIVC for delayed release formulation. I can use mean when the shape is okay and you don't have a lot of differences in the Tmax between uh, all the subjects. And you will see that at the end, the difference is not going to be so huge. When I have it like this, uh, you can have uh, here you can see this is the individual value and this is the mean one. When you have the mean, which is in black, the geometric mean, which is in red, and in purple, you have the median, you can see that at the beginning and at the end, the shape are almost correct. Oh, by the way, it's very strange here. I don't have any more red curve. I don't have any more red curve because I may have one value, which is BLQ, and maybe I have said that the value be below BLQ is going to be treated as zero. So you can see that in this case, my geometric mean is going to be here, uh, stopped here. It seems to be almost correct, but you can see that on the zone of the Cmax, you have some differences. And those differences mean that you don't have at all the same shape. You have the median and the geometric mean, which are here, and you have, uh, excuse me, the mean and the geometric mean, which are here, and the median, which is here. You can think that it's very important, but it's not so important if you treat all the values in the same way. So, viability, because it's a uh, webinar about viability. Viability, you have it all the time. The between subject viability is something that you have, it's called the standard deviation, or it's called, if you prefer, the coefficient of variation of the relative standard deviation. You have a standard deviation for geometric mean, for mean values. You don't have it for the median, but for the median, you can have the minimum, the maximum value, the Q1, that means the first quartile, the third quartile, which is free, Q3, the interquartile range. You have a lot of things which are existing. That is the between subject variability. And the within subject variability, you have it for the parameters, is nothing more than the residual errors of your ANOVA for the AUC and Cmax. So have a look now. Have a look about the central values and on the mean curve. That is the mean, the median, and the geometric mean of my 12 subjects. This is uh, the, the value that I observe of the AUC and Cmax on the mean curve, median curve, and geometric mean curve. What is the difference? You can see that the mean for AUCT is quite close to the median quite close to the geometric mean. You can see that geometric mean and median are closer together. That means that I have one extreme high subject, which is going to influence less here, the geometric mean and the median. For the value that I have here on the mean curve, you can see that I have something which is 
very close to the mean here. The median is quite close to the median, but the geometric mean is not at all close to the AUC calculated on the geometric mean curve. Why? Very easy. That is due to the fact that at the end of my geometric mean curve, the value below limit of quantitation was set to zero, and then I was not allowed to calculate this curve. So you can see that on the AUCs, I can have a difference between those two values. The Cmax is not going to be very different because the Cmax is nothing more than a single point. So now, let's see example. You have here all your curve and that is real data. You can see it's not as nice as usual. You can see that between the subject, it seems that I have my Cmax, which is really in this zone. That means the shape of all the subject is almost similar. I calculate here the geometric mean, the median, and the mean curve. So what can I do here? I can think either I make my IVIVC subject by subject, or I make it on the mean values or median or geometric mean values. By the way, you can see that I have still the same problem with the geometric mean at the end of a curve. Is that a problem to make it on mean values? Really think to it. Be a little bit pragmatic. When you make a level C IVIVC, that means when you make an IVIVC, which is going to be based on PK parameters versus some dissolution parameters. For example, the C max here versus the quantity dissolved at two hours. You are going to make a link here and this link, even if you have all the subjects which are here represented by any marks, you don't make a link subject by subject. You make it for all of them. That means between this one and the value that you calculate only on the mean of each of the formulations, you can see that the slope is equally the same, that the intercept is the same. So that means to make it like this on all the data or to make it on the mean, do not modify the results. This is all the individual subjects. You can see that you cannot make an IVIVC subject by subjects. So that means for the level C IVIVC, you never ask yourself the questions, do I have to do it subject by subject or can I do it only on the mean values? You don't take into account when you are in level C IVIVC the fact you, that you have the same subject, that means you are in a crossover design and nobody is going to complain about that. So why cannot do the same thing for a level A IVIVC? For dissolution is the same thing. You are going to use the mean dissolution and not the individual dissolutions for a very simple reason is that dissolution is the destructive test. That means when you have performed the dissolution, you don't have any more of a tablet. That means you cannot pair one tablet for one subject. So that means no problem. So what can I do? Based on the previous data, I can have my absorption subject by subject. This is all the individual absorption. That means I have of course, a UIR, which is subject by subject. Or for example, I can use Wagner-Nelson if it's a one compartment model. I will have here the mean, the median, and the geometric mean curve, which is the mean, median, and geometric mean of those one. I can use here, you can see, my mean concentrations, median concentration, and geometric mean concentration. You can see that around the Cmax, I have small differences. The geometric mean is smaller in this case, and the arithmetic mean is higher, but the shape is not dramatically different, except here for this point. This is the deconvolution made based on the mean curves, geometric mean or median curve. So the question is, do I have a difference between the two methods? Now what I made, I made something very simple. I compare the geometric mean calculate on the central value, that means on the geometric mean curve, and in purple I have the geometric mean of all the individual deconvolutions. So that means I compare something that I made on the central, or if you prefer, on the mean plasma concentration curve to the mean of all the individuals you can see that you don't have a huge difference anyway. 
So that means to make the mean before or after the deconvolution is not going to impact so largely the response. Knowing that when I make a mean uh, on all the individuals, that means when I want to make the convolution, I have to do it subject by subject. And so I will maybe have something which is better, but I cannot extrapolate for another group of subjects. So if I mean after absorption, the prediction must be made subject by subject, as I told you, but also go a little bit further, I have to use, if I use a Wagner-Nelson, I have to pay attention to the fact that some subject can have a flip-flop and not the others. If some subject can have a flip-flop and not the others, that means I have to go subject by subject and I cannot use some subroutines. So I don't have any automated template. So, and I must generate all the NCA to compare to the initial one. If I have a delayed release formulation, it's more risky and that you go back to the previous webinar. If I mean before the absorption, that means I will have the intra-subject variability and the between-subject variability, which is known anyway. The between-subject variability is nothing more than the standard deviation. It's going to be related with the mean curve which are displayed in the report, but I have to relate my non-compartmental analysis, that means my AUC and CMAX to the mean curve one and not to the individuals. All correction, and mean AF is going to be included directly, no problem. And I don't have to treat the flip-flop subject by subject, but only once on the initial data. So on the mean, what I said, you have to be careful. You have to use either the geometric mean, the arithmetic mean, or the median value. I don't like the geometric mean. I prefer to use either arithmetic mean or median values. You are going to try in this case to also include inside when you predict the variability and you know it is the standard deviation. But you have to be also careful to something. If you improve the bioavailability of your drug, you cannot predict it. And that is something which is common for all the IV IVCs. Be careful because between studies, you may have exactly the same thing because between studies, you are going to be back with a between subject variability. And in this case, the fact to use the mean value is going to be more easy because you will have the mean for subject A and the mean for subject B. You have a direct scaling between the two. If you don't have it, how are you going to scale? You cannot pair subject by subject. You cannot say the subject one of the study one correspond to the subject two of the study two. You don't know. If it's not the same subject, you don't know how to pair it. So that means you don't know how to correct subject by subject. If you want to correct from study one to study two, very often you are going to use something which is going to be based on mean data, either mean of individuals or mean of a mean curve. So what can you use to correct? Either you have a unit impulse response in all the studies. That means you are very rich and you can have the IV or a fast formulation in each studies. That is very nice. If you don't have it, what is very important is to have one common formulation in all the studies. If you want to make a generic, you are going to make in the pilot reference versus test one. In the pilot two, you are going to make reference versus test two. And in the pivot all, reference versus your final formulation. You can see that you have the three references and you can scale by the reference. That is something which is very easy. So, between study, you need to have a common formulation. And you are going to correct by what? The CMAX? No, it's a single point. The more easy thing is to correct by the quantity. And the best thing to correct by a quantity is to correct by the AUC. That means you are going to use, in this case, the ratio of AUC between study one and two for the reference formulation, for example, to correct the test two compared to the test one. What can you use? You can use something which is a XY uh, module of Phoenix, or you can use the data wizard. Both of them are working. In the XY, you, what are you going to use? You are going to use, for example, worksheet one, which is, for example, here is the internal or URL. You can use something which is common between the two. And you are going to use, for example, for the UC, the geometric mean, the same thing for the second one. And you are going to say that the new one is going to be a F, a correction factor, 
which is going to be very close to the bioavailability and is going to be the ratio between the two. This ratio is going to allow you to scale between study one and study two, that means to scale between the subjects which are not the same between the two studies. To make something very easy, you can see here that I am going back to my data of the study one and study two with the two references. You can see that this one is going to be here around four and this one is greater than four. And if I go to the AUC, you can see that between study one and study two, my reference, that means the same formulation of the same batch is different only due to the fact that I have different subjects. For example, here on the mean of all individual value, I go to 36 to 41. And on the mean curve, I go to 36 to 40, a little bit more than 40 here. If I take the AUC to infinity, I have something which is similar. That means between the two, the reference formulation is 14%, almost 14% greater in the study two compared to the study one. This is not due to the fact that the reference formulation is better, but is due to the fact that in the study two, you don't have the same subject as in the study one. And if you want to compile both of them and, for example, use the study one to establish your IVIVC and use the study two to validate your IVIVC, if you don't make this scaling factor, which is a factor of 14, you will be out of the predictability because the difference, even if you are perfectly equal, is going to be 14%. If you don't have any common formulation, you are lost. You can make nothing. So I go to the next part here of this presentation, which is I don't have any IV or any unit in post response. And I want to use something which was generated before. So I'm exactly back to my problem, which is a between subject viability. I cannot pair the IV of a study zero with the subject one of a study zero with the study one subject one or study two subject one. That is not the same subjects. And pairing like this, the subject together, is something that I cannot do. So what can I do? I can make the deconvolution versus the mean IV of the study zero or the model of the IV of the study zero. So then I have something which is based on the mean value. And if I want to scale study one to study two, I will use, in this case, the reference formulation. Is that a load or is that a real problem? Officially, that is not a load by the authorities, but you can discuss in some cases with them because you don't have any other thing to do. For a theoretical point of view, it's not a major issue because you use a function to make the deconvolution, but you will use exactly the inverse of this function to make the convolution. That means if you have made a mistake in one sense, you will, make, you will correct it when you are going to predict. What is more easy in this case, because you don't have the same subject, is to re-include the bioavailability, the F, back when you calculate and to try to estimate all the absorption as a percentage of a fraction of those. That means something which is going to go from 0 to 100% and not to 0 to the F. Why? Because as you have a difference and you use a reference from other study, the problem in this case is that you may have a difference in the F, which are not going to be linked with the performance of your formulation, but with the subject effect. So that is something that you can reintroduce in the calculation. Another approach, which is exactly the same one as this one, but which is more complicated in my point of view, because it's a one step approach or a population approach, is not to start to make a deconvolution, to make your IVIVC, to try to go ahead and to correct everything, to, to scale between the studies, is to use a population approach. This population approach is called a one-step approach in a lot of guidelines, for example, in the European guideline. You avoid to question on the mean value in this case, as you are going to use all the data, and you will select the right covariate to scale between the study. The classical two-stage method is a deconvolution base, and in this case, you can uh, use uh, something to scale between the study. The one-stage approach includes a convolution base or, for example, PBPK models. This two-stage approach, uh, excuse me, the two-stage approach is very important when you want to initiate your IVIVC 
because somehow you are going to see which are the key factors and the key covariate. For example, in the European guideline about modified release pharmacokinetic uh, formulation, you have a part where we describe the two-stage and the one-stage approach and we explain that when you want to explore at the beginning your IV, IVC, it's better to use a, a two-stage approach because you are, it's more easy in this case to see which are the relevant covariate and the key factors. The advantages of the one-stage population approach is that you can use something which is a very nice name, non-linear mixed effect analysis. Okay. okay, very nice things. That means that you are going to include covariates. You have two examples, and the example that you can use is this one, which is going to, uh, which is displayed and free access on PQRI, which is a one-stage approach and the population approach, and the second one, which was made using Phoenix and published by the FDA, which is the paper here of uh, Maziar Kaki, which is here, which was published in 2017, that means which is quite modern, I would say, because it's only three years old. The same thing, this paper is a free access paper. So do not hesitate if you want to learn a little bit more about the possibility here uh, to make a one-stage approach to consult these two papers. This one is going to use something which is an, an non-linear mixed effect model, which is a stochastic deconvolution approach, but that is working perfectly well and you can program it in Phoenix if you want. So as a conclusion, what I want to say, I want to tell you that this factor is not anymore, is not always estimated as a critical factor. By this factor, I, I am speaking about viability. You must take it into account, <coughs> excuse me, uh, when it's a crossover design, but between studies, because when you have crossover studies, but you want to scale between studies, you are back to parallel design. And that also is something that you have to keep in mind. It's not because you have study one, which is a crossover, and study two, which is a crossover design, but you have no problem because you have to scale between the studies. And scaling between the studies mean, in this case, that you need to try to react exactly as you were reacting with parallel groups. So be careful to that. On PK parameters, as well as on time concentration curve, the coefficient of variation and standard deviation are existing. That means variability is known. Be careful also, as a conclusion, when you use geometric means, how you are going to treat the BLQ data. So do you have any questions? Hi, Dr. Cardo. Thank you so much for these presentations. We do have several questions that have been coming in. Uh, let me ask you the first question. The first question was, and I think you might have clarified it, but just to confirm, do I need individual UIR, UIRs for the convolution or can I take the mean uh, from the literature reference, for example? Officially, you must have it subject by subject. But when you want to explore your data, you can use something which is either from a previous study and uh, you may, for example, be careful also to use something from literature data. And you can, in this case, explore your IVIVC using, using this, I would say, unique UIR. But you have to be careful to something, is that is the quality of your data. If your data don't have the right quality, that means if your data are too old, the UIR can be wrong because you don't have the right estimation of the PK parameters. That is something that you have to pay attention. And very often, the IV data are existing in large companies at the beginning of the development of a drug, but not at the end in all the studies. So that means using something like this, it's not a problem. Uh, you have really to pay attention on the fact and to describe it to the authorities. Great, thank you very much. Um, another question relates to when we're talking about the population approach. Uh, what could be covariates in a one-stage approach and uh, aside apart from study? You can have clearances, which can be a covariate if your drug exhibits, for example, a high viability, which is linked with a clearance. That can be the sex also. That can be other things like this. You can have a lot of covariances, but you have to be careful because when you increase the number of covariate, you can achieve something which seems to work, 
but why it's working? Because it's over-parameterized. So you have to be very careful for that. Very often, for example, when you have highly viable drugs, you would need uh, to, I would say, to adjust by the clearance, which is a very good covariate, if you have it. If you don't have it, very often it's going to be by age, sex, and other parameters like both one. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, there's several other questions coming in. Uh, here's one. Is intersubject variability a real problem in IBIBC if the intrasubject variability is low? Good question. Uh, if you have only one single study, the answer is no. No, because somehow you are going to have always the same subject for all the formulations. But as soon as you want to predict a new uh, formulation in new subjects, or as soon as you want to use more than one study, in this case, the between subject variability is of importance. Because between the studies, uh, you don't have the same subjects. And if you don't have the same subject between the studies, the results that you can observe, for example, for another study can be higher, not due to the fact that your formulation has a better performance or has a burst, but only to the fact that you don't have the same subjects. Only to give you an idea, which is going to be a, a little bit uh, straightforward idea. If you go around the world, you have, for example, the um, people from Sweden, you have people from Portugal, you have people from France, if we stay in Europe. We don't have the same body shape. We don't have the same body shape because we are influenced by other factors, by the way we are living, that the food habits and so on. Depending on that, of course, we will not have the same fat mass. We are not going to have the same uh, height and the same weight that could influence the response. And in this case, between a study which could be performed, for example, in Sweden and one in Portugal or in France, I may have differences, not due to my formulation, but only to the fact that I don't use the same subjects. I have nothing against the Swedish and the Portuguese, okay? <laughs> don't be afraid for that. Okay, um, I think we have time for another question. There was a little bit more of, they needed more clarification on the previous one from population, but we can address that later on in the Q&A that we will put with the recording. Um, there was okay. a question also that was related to SAS and how does SAS calculate the geometric mean and if it's different compared to Phoenix method? I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Yeah. Um, uh, SAS, Excel and Phoenix, uh, of course, use some algorithms. Officially, I say officially, it could be very similar, but only to give you, and I'm not going to discuss about one is better than the other, but only to give you an idea when you compare, for example, Excel and SAS, you may have some differences, not because Excel is better or worse, because they don't use the same number of digits. For example, you are going to use by standard default, something like 16 digits in Excel and only eight in SAS at the beginning, if you don't program it to have 16. That means by default, you don't have exactly the same thing. So that means also you can have some differences in the way you calculate, for example, the mean values, or in the way you are going to assess quartiles or percentiles between SAS and Phoenix and Excel, which are due to the algorithms. The difference is going to be, I would say, marginal when you are not dealing with something which is just borderline. So you have differences, of course, you have to know about them and you have to be careful on what you are going to use and to describe really what you are going to use. The problem is that very often you don't know exactly what you are going to use and you don't know what you are going to use because it's not you which is programming everything and you don't control everything by default. Great. Well, that brings us to the top of the hour. Thank you so much for this very, uh, very informative webinar. Uh, for everyone, just to let you know, there was a reference to a previous webinar uh, with the late release drug formulations, and I have put the link in the chat. Um, if there are other questions that you have typed in the Q&A that we didn't have time to address, we will uh, provide an, uh, a Q&A and answer with the recording. So thank you yeah, so and, much for attending. And uh, the Q&A answer is going to be made in one or two weeks when I will have more than one questions. <laughs> yes. Okay, don't be afraid, I, I always answer for that. Uh, you had also this last slide that you put in, uh... okay? Is okay? 
So goodbye and have a nice evening.